Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2019 of Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker you can find at freedomain.com. He has over 600 million podcast downloads and about a million YouTube subscribers. And in my judgment, he's one of the greatest living philosophers alive today. He's also dedicated to reason, philosophy, and saving Western civilization. Gentlemen, without further ado, please let me welcome to the stage, Stefan Molyneux. Thanks, man. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really uh, appreciate it. You guys can hear me all right? Good, good. OK, so I'm going to introduce you to my superpower. And my superpower is something that I kind of discovered at an early age. I'm going to pass it along to you so that you can use it to really help the world. The superpower is really fascinating because we live in a post-philosophical society. We live in a post-reason society, in a post-evidence society. And it's really fascinating how we've got rid of universal ethics and replaced it with insanely complex, vicious judgments. There's an old saying that says, if you get rid of the big laws, you don't get no laws, you get thousands of tiny laws. And that's the case. There were 10 commandments. How many commandments are there in woke leftist culture? 10,000 and counting. So once you understand that nobody has any values, objective values. I mean, there are, there are Christians, which I respect, and that's great. But in terms of the public square, it's dominated largely by postmodernists, relativists, subjectivists, neo-Marxists, outright Marxists. And it's all power. It's all power and manipulation. So the, su the superpower, which I'm going to put on full display today, is this. If you don't have a problem with what you're saying, other people are like, OK. That's a very, very powerful thing. Because I've had it commented to me many times that I can say things that other people won't touch with a 10-foot pole and walk out like some superhero from the smoking rubble, you know, Luke Skywalker style, just brushing stuff off my shoulders. And that is because if I don't have a problem with what I'm saying, it's really hard for other people to have a problem with what I'm saying. So with that in mind, I will demonstrate the superpower. And listen, let's do a back and forth here, because you know this is just a high, big high-res screen unless we're participating. So you know, throw your hand up, and uh, if I ask for feedback or whatever, feel free to, to yell out. But this is the superpower, I think. Particularly in this room at this convention, there are so many of us who have so much to say to women, and we don't. Why? Because we're scared. And, and I'll tell you why. We have good reason to be scared. So this speech is everything we want to say to women. Now, we only have an hour. So I'm going to speak really fast. It's going to sound like faxing. But no, so we don't have a lot of time, so I've tried to really sort of boil it down to the essentials. But whatever I miss, you know, just let me know, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Oh, also, I'm going to do a workshop this afternoon at 1.30. Just, you know, I do a, I've done a call-in show for like 15 years. So just, you know, come and we'll talk philosophy about whatever, you, whatever your issues are, whatever you want to work through. We'll do that, and that'll be a lot of fun, a very powerful thing, I'm sure. So I'm going to generalize. Just brace yourself. <laughs> I'm going to generalize. Because you know, there's this rule on the internet and in public discourse that you say, here's a general rule. Here's an exception. I know. <laughs> I know. Men, on average, are taller than women. Oh, yeah? I know a tall woman. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you take discourse out back of the woodshed and put a bullet in its head. So yes, I'm going to generalize, and, and not you guys so much, but you know, whenever this ends up out on the web, people are going to be like, exception, 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 exception. It's like, I know, I know, I know. But we're going to, we're going to do it anyway. Because you know, we're talking about men and women, and there are generalities to be made. So the first question is, and you guys let me know what you think. I don't think I'm alone in being scared of telling women the truth. It seems to be, if you ever follow my Twitter account, 
<laughs> you can see that um, stating basic biological and evolutionary truths appears to be uh, attempting to dry hump a wasp's nest. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the, the guys who laugh are the guys who've tried it. So that's like vivid personal experience, right? I'm not pleased to see you. I just humped a wasp nest earlier. <laughs> You know, the thing I love about live speaking is I never know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I say things like that, and sentences I never thought I'd say in my life. OK, so if you've been nervous, just you know, throw your hand up, you bellow something out. If you've been nervous, oh yeah, OK, the wasp nest guys. Um, why do you think, or is it true for you, that you feel nervous to tell women basic truths like, there's a wall, you know, stuff like that, right? What do you, what do you think? Why, is it, why are you nervous? Could get heated, OK. They won't accept it. What else? Freak out. They will freak out? Yeah, based on what evidence? I'm just kidding, just kidding. No, what? They, they want to shoot the messenger. They want to shoot the messenger, OK. Anything else? Most of the time, they won't understand it anyways. They won't understand it anyways, OK. So it's like, you know, teaching cha-cha to a meerkat or something, OK. All right, anything? Because, but that wouldn't be fear. That would just be like, why bother, right? So is it, is it fear of blowback? Is it fear of, of being attacked? Is right? But you know, women are smaller in general, and you know, it's, it's online, so they're not like in the room right, with some machete. So I think that there's a good reason why we're scared. Because women can kill us. And I don't mean physically, I mean genetically. Because when we're talking about the West here, right? So in the West, Consent has been the norm for reproduction for thousands of years. You know, we don't wrap our women in a bag and keep them in the house, right? At least, I hope the hell you don't. <laughs> so what can women do to us that's so terrifying? Well, they can say no. They can say no. Do you know what percentage of men throughout history have not reproduced? 60%? Any, anyone else? 98. <laughs> 98. <laughs> are, you from, are you from Saudi Arabia? I'm just. <laughs> so uh, it depends where you look at it, but the number is around 40% of men did not reproduce. Now that sucks. Like, yeah, I think, what is it, 3 billion, 4 billion years, years of evolution? I mean, think of all that struggle, you know, like some single-celled organism eyeballing the open air, saying, all right, we're going to make a break for it. We're going out of the ocean. We're hitting the sand, boys. We're going, and fighting and, and dying, and, and, uh, and then like four billion years, and then you, she says, no, that's it. It's like the Texas sharpshooter just blows off your balls because the evolution of your entire line stops there when she says no. Like, here's an interesting question. Tell me what you guys think. Why on earth? Do men go to war? Now, if there are wars like guys, people are invading, guys obviously, guys are invading your local space, right? So there are those wars where it's like, okay, I regret, I gotta pull out my sword, I go fight or whatever. But, you know, like Syria, Kuwait, Iraq, I mean, just like, why? Why, why do guys go to war? Why do you think? I mean, so, so I remember thinking about this as a kid, right? Now, there's the draft and all of that, but I think it was in the First World War, hundreds of thousands of American men just said, uh, you want the draft? Here's my butt. And they just didn't go. Not much happened. Why? Why do, why do men go and fight in these useless wars? It's not like they're well paid. Yes? To prove to people that they're not a pussy, basically. Like Depussification. That certainly is a, it's a, a Brazilian wax, I think it's called. No, uh, <laughs> Should I bring more of my inner sensor to bear on the conversation or not? No? OK. OK. All right. Then I'm going to just not. OK. Um, OK. So yeah, you don't want to be called a pussy, right? OK. What else? Why? Why? I mean, you're risking life and limb trauma. Yeah. To preserve life. To preserve life. Well, yeah, but it doesn't. I mean, really. Uh, you know, I mean, war in Syria and Libya, I mean, this doesn't preserve life, right? Honor. honor? OK. Honor. Right. That's fair. Oh, yeah, because all those Libyans were coming over in canoes, right? But yeah, that, that's what the story is, right? Sorry? Power. But the soldier doesn't have power, because the soldier has to take orders, right? 
The illusion of power, yeah. Now, I would say, you guys know, you're woke enough, right, to, to these issues. You know about the White Feather Campaign? Yeah. You guys heard this? Any, how many people have or haven't? You have? Okay, well, real brief then. So, uh, a man can be killed with a feather. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And I'm not just talking some, like, Swedish BDSM thing, but, or am I? No, I'm not. So, a man can be killed with a feather because in the First World War, Everybody was, in, like the British were very enthusiastic. Why? Because there hadn't been a war in Western Europe since the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. The Franco-Prussian a little bit here and there. But so everyone was like, oh, I know what war is. War is like all those paintings that we see. There's a white horse, you're charging, there's cheers, there's, you know, like all the stuff you play as a kid, you know, like that's war. And they were all signing up. And they were terrified it was going to be over by Christmas. That was the word, right? 1914. Oh, man, it's going to be over by Christmas. i got to get in there and get my stories and get my medals and my heroism. Spoiler, it wasn't over by Christmas. Right? First World War just went on and on. And really, it was the greatest catastrophe to hit the Western world ever, ever, ever. Wiped out almost all of the economic gains from the Industrial Revolution, so all those kids got black lung for nothing. And after a while, people were like, I don't really want to go. <laughs> like, it, it's trench warfare, which is just about the worst thing. The truth came out that war is not riding up a hill with a sword and cheering and right, a heroic noble death if necessary, but war is sitting in a half-frozen muddy ditch with rats gnawing off your toes while some asshole 20 miles away pushes a button and blows you up. And of course, there was the Christmas peace where the British and the German soldiers said, hey, it's Christmas, let's just play football, soccer. It was terrifying to the powers that be that people might realize they have much more in common with the people across the trench than the people high up at their power structure. So men didn't want to go. So enlistments just cratered. So women would take a white feather and they would walk up and down the streets. And if they saw a military-aged man who was not in uniform, they would hand him a white feather, which was a symbol of cowardice. And this was terrifying to men. Now, this makes no sense when you think about it, but then it does. So it makes no sense because it's like, ooh, a feather. Sure, I'll go get my ass blown off in a trench. But here's the thing. The reason that men go to war is because women won't sleep with them if they don't. That's it. And this motivates so much of what we do. And it's not crazy and it's not neurotic. It makes perfect sense, evolutionarily speaking. Let's say you go to war, and let's say you have a 50% chance of dying. But if you don't go to war, no woman will sleep with you. For the continuance of your genetics, is it better to go to war or not? Better to go to war. Better to go to war. If you go to war, you've got a 50% chance of passing on your genes. If you don't go to war, you have 0% chance of passing on your genes. That's why we're scared. Because all the men who said, I don't care what women think, offended and upset women, where they were like, no thanks, boy. Sorry, we're closed. They used the old, you know, the old, you can get birth control for 10 cents. Just hold it there. <laughs> so if women said, we're not going to sleep with you if you don't fight, you go fight. Because then you've got a chance to continue your genes. Otherwise, it ends right there. So we're scared. Now, uh, do you guys do Twitter? Just hands up if you do. All right. OK, so on Twitter, there's kind of like a cliche. Like if you upset women, what do the, what do the women say? In cell. In cell, right? Involuntary celibate, right? Who hurt you? Who hurt you? What else? You live in your mom's basement, right? Neck beard, right? No penis. Sorry? No penis. Uh, small penis. Uh, not necessarily no penis. No functional penis, I suppose. That's the incel thing, right? So, yeah, you, you can't get laid. Uh, 
small penis, uh, your, your mommy issues, and so on, right? Now, that, of course, is, you know how like they do things in the military, they'll paint you with a target that you can't see, and then some other infrared thing points out the target. So women, what they're trying to do is draw a moat around you, and they'll say this very explicitly online. They'll say, ladies, here's a symbol, here's exactly who you should never date. And they'll broadcast it out across the gynocentric undertow network, right? Don't date this guy, right? That's genetic death. It's the rejection sharpshooter that takes off your balls. Genetically, they are warriors, because a warrior can end your bloodline if he kills you before you have children or kills your children as well. Women can do the same thing. Now, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Of course, women <laughs> should be able to say no to anyone and everyone that they want, but let's at least recognize that that's a very powerful thing. And all the men who said, I don't care, offended women, the women didn't sleep with them, and that indifference was weeded right out of the gene pool. Right? So we're scared because we're smart, and we're scared because we're these blind photocopiers who want to make more of us, and we need women to do it. So that's why it's hard to tell women the truth, because if they get mad and they tell all the other women, and remember, our brains, we don't know that there's more than 100 people around. Because we grew up in these little villages, these little tribes, little farming communities, and so on. It's like Amish horizon world to our lizard brains. So if women start the slander campaign against you, you're done. So you can't anger women, except today. <laughs> Maybe it's because I already have a kid. Maybe it's because I'm very happily married. I don't know. But I have the capacity to sew. So these are the things that I think we, we should talk about. And I think women should hear. Because it's one thing to have the genetic death power. It's another thing to have the sexual power. It's another thing to have the outvoting men political power, outliving men political power. You put all those things together. And the great danger is you create a generation of vapid, self-obsessed narcissists who explode into two-year-old tantrum, toddler explosions of verbal abuse whenever their omnipotent wills are crossed. And we want to make sure that never happens in the future. Because <laughs> it might. It just might. So, in no particular order, this is what I think women need to hear. Number one, the wall takes no prisoners. What does that mean? My friend's in the front. Is it sell by date? Your eggs are going to die. And the, the, all the power, like, nature balances out, right? All the sexual power that women have when they're young falls off a cliff in extraordinary rapidity. Now, here's the thing, though, is that when, men, when we're young and we have less sexual market value than women, supply and demand, hormones and receptivity, we can, if we, we can screw up for a while, and I'm sure everyone has, I know I have, but then you can recover, right? So, you know, I went to theater school. <laughs> I got a history degree, because I'm all about the earning, right? But then I was like, wake up, dude. And I went and started a software company. <clears throat> so you can shake it off, and you can turn things around if you make. But if, you, if a woman takes full advantage of that sexual magnetism of youth, and you know, hoingo boingos around the community, then by the time she hits her late 30s, it's too late. And then you get like a half century of regret. And one of my biggest tweets over the last couple of months was me just saying, women, your eggs die at 40, you live to 80. What are you going to do for 40 years? I think that's a reasonable question. <laughs> it is. And, and because I don't have a problem asking it, people get mad. And I, I just think it's OK. Like, this is how you toughen up, right? It's how you toughen up. I remember when I was a kid. 
I mean, we all have the same. I had a Scottish teacher, of, a gym teacher, which is barely a teacher, but, um, and he had this, you know, full-on Scottish whiskey tobacco breath and all of that, right? And I remember getting my face slammed into the wood on the ground during wrestling, and, you know, you walk it off, you know? <laughs> walk it off. It's like, it's my face. I don't walk on my face. Anyway. But, of course, you know, a girl stubs her toes and like, nurse! <laughs> right? It's just, I don't know, it's just double standards, which are kind of inevitable, right? But there's a wall. And by the time the woman figures out that there's a wall, it's too late. And that's, you know, if, if we care about women, and of course we should, then we have to remind them about the wall. It's important. I mean, it's not just important for women's happiness, but if we like this crazy little thing we have called the civilization, you know, we're going to need a baby or two. And reminding them of that. And, and oddly enough, one of the most interesting and, and powerful courses I ever took, I did two years of English literature before I went to theater school, then I finished undergraduate and graduate in history. But in my, in my English literature course, we did Victorian novels. Right, sounds boring as hell, right? But it was incredible because these Victorian novels and the pre-Victorian novels were basically written with one aim in mind, to remind women that they, the power that they have will not last. And they need to choose the best man they can in the bloom of their youth and sexual beauty because it's gonna fade. And just remind, 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 train women, and also train women how to spot guys who are unreliable, you know, like the rakes, the guys who'll use women and, and just toss them aside and the pump and dumps and the, you know, dine and dash kind of guys, right? To train them how to do that. Because now women seem to have completely lost the ability to figure out the good guys from the bad guys. And we just need to remind them. Because do you, you guys remember what it was like before puberty, right? Like before, you know, when girls were like, oh, you want to play baseball, really? Okay, I guess his sister can come along, right? Because it was a drag. You know, I used to play, because I grew up in England in the 70s, and we used to, like, it was war obsessed, right? Second World War, we played war games all the time, right? And occasionally, not often, but the girls would come like, we want to play too. And it was like, we don't need a nurse, because that's all you want to be. <laughs> we heal with man magic. And it was a drag, right? It was a drag, because, you know, it, it play tag, you know, the girl girly run, right? It's just, it was kind of a drag, and it was like a negative, right? And then suddenly, it's, it literally was for me like one day, girls are like, eh. And the other day, it's like, girls, 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 you know, like this tsunami of hormones just jets up from the base of your spine and turns you into a monomaniac. And it's like, it's like, well, it's possession, basically. There was an ancient Greek philosopher who said what he loved about being in his 70s was he finally felt free of the demon of lust. And I'll tell you something. Even at the time, I don't know if you ever had this thought, even at the time when all of these hormones are coursing through you and all you can think about is girls, at the time, I remember thinking to myself, if girls are so innately appealing, why do I need all these hormones? <laughs> It's a big question, isn't it? It's a big question. You know, if you've got some guy, some friend, right, and you only want to hang with him if he's flying you to Cabo for the weekend, your friend at some point is going to say, why do I have to keep flying my friends to Cabo for the weekend? Why, can't, why don't they just interested in me? Why don't they just like me? It's like, because you're a douchebag, but we like Cabo. And I remember that, like, girls going from kind of annoying to, like, the reason to get out of bed in the morning, the reason why I had to pretend to play tennis to explain my carpal tunnel, I mean, all of that. Take a moment. <laughs> so, when you get that full-on geyser of hormones that just makes you think about girls all the time, there is that question, like, and, and you lose your reason. I mean, you really do, man. Uh, this is why philosophy became very important to me. Because if I just surrendered to hormones, you just, you just washed off a cliff. We all know guys who just like smashed up against female narcissism or whatever. It's, it's really brutal. I mean, 
It's crazy stuff. What's the craziest thing you did in your teens to get women's attention or to please women? I'll give you mine. Well, no, that's not the craziest. So I had a math test that was really, really important. And I had a pencil. And the girl in front of me turned around and said, hey, can I, can I use your pencil? I had one pencil. I said, listen, I don't want genetic death, so here you go. I gave her my pencil. <laughs> Whereas, you know, like a year earlier, it'd be like, hey, hey, you don't have a pencil. <laughs> no, and it's weird because I like sitting there at my test, like literally thinking, can I gouge my finger <laughs> and write in blood <laughs> the answers to this math question? That's how insane it becomes. Can't say no, can't upset the ladies. It's genetic death. Ah, you know, I can survive without doing well on a math test, but I cannot survive. Women say no to me, which is genetically completely true. All right, anybody else got a silly story about crazy things you did to impress women? Oh, and I got another one. I was at a friend of mine's place, and there were these two gymnasts. Okay, sorry. Um, just having a private moment. There were these two gymnasts there, and... <laughs> They were showing how they could, like, I won't do it here, but you could, like, hand, head down, like a tripod, and your legs go up on the wall. And, of course, you know, they do this, and their tops, you know, you see their bellies, and it's gymnast tautness and all that. It's, like, very attractive, right? So I'm like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was a runner. I was a swimmer, a tennis, and I was not any kind of gymnast. I have the flexibility of your average slab of sidewalk. So... I do this, and I take, I figured the best way to do it is to take a run at it, you know, to get some momentum. What did I do? I just put my head through the wall. <laughs> that does not get you extra points unless you've got a lot of money for the Russian judges. But, uh, so this is just crazy stuff that you do to, to get and keep the attention of women. And then there's that fork in the road, right? Because sensibly, you know, you should go for a sensible, solid, dependable woman. But then there's that crazy hot factor. You know, this is stuff I've talked about on my show, the R versus K selection. You can look it up if you want on my channel. But I remember there was this girl, really, really nice girl. I, and the sad, sad, sad thing is I actually remember all of these names, even now, like, I don't know, close to 40 years later. Really nice girl. She played the cello, and she had a T-shirt, totally nerdy, cello power, really nice girl. Uh, you know, we, we chat, really great conversationalist, right? But then there was this really hot German girl. Now, you know, going back in time, you know, you know the sensible course. You know, good mom for the kids, you know, uh, reliable, steady, uh, good support system, great friend, and so on. It's like, yeah, but, but German hotness. So, of course, I go out with the German girl. Why? Apparently, I like being ordered around. <laughs> And you just make all of these crazy decisions. And that's the power that women have. And of course they know it, but they don't want to talk about it explicitly. Because it's kind of humiliating to say men need me not because of the innate qualities of my character or the virtues that I've earned or the great conversational abilities I've developed or the knowledge I have accrued, but because they have excess fluids. They're like a submarine that needs to surface. <laughs> dump the fluids, dump the fluids. <laughs> That's kind of humiliating. And so it's not talked about that much. I did talk recently uh, on, on Twitter about makeup. Because, I mean, you guys probably know all of the ideology of makeup, right? The makeup is designed to simulate sexual arousal, right? So lipstick, when a woman gets sexually aroused, I can see it in the back, just kidding. So when a woman gets sexually aroused, she, her, her lips get fuller and they get redder, her cheeks flush, right? This is the, uh, the root of, of blush and so on, right? And her pupils sort of dilate a little, her eyes get a little wider, which is why mascara makes eyes pop and all of that, and why those weird, creepy Disney eyes have like complete baby Facial features, like right? this, is creepy. <laughs> Once you see that in Disney cartoons, it's like really creepy, because you know eyes are the one thing that don't change in size over the course of our life. 
And so you, when you were a baby, you got giant eyes. And so basically, Disney princesses are all, it's all pedo crap. But so for women, <clears throat> coming into a room with blatant signs of sexual arousal is pretty manipulative, right? And in the business world, would be entirely inappropriate. I mean, can you imagine if I had a business meeting and I came in with a full-on Freddie Mercury or Justin Trudeau cucumber, like Spinal Tap, just strapped to my leg there and just kind of sat there like this, you know, with some woman sitting there. And that would be like, what are you, insane? What are you, like, bringing a full-on forearm boner to a business meeting? <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> But it's, it's, it, would be, it would be wildly inappropriate for a man to bring signs of sexual arousal to a business meeting, but women do it all the time. All the time. And they don't like to have it pointed out. Because once you see the magic, it's not magic. Knowledge is power when it, when, with regards to female manipulation. Do you guys know what high heels are for? Sorry? Longer legs? Yeah, but I mean, I don't know that men particularly care about longer legs, depending on your sexual position preference or whatever, right? A couple of telephone books, but. Um, <clears throat> sorry? Yeah, what it does, I'm sorry to do this to you. <laughs> this is an image you'll never lose. Right, so it puts your butt out, and then, because you're like, right? So it puts your butt out, and then you, you go forward, which pushes your boobs out, or in my case, my moves, right? So. That's what it's for. It's to turn you into that ridiculous kind of twisted oblong, push out your boobs, push out your butt. And then when you walk, right, there was some model who said it's just basically putting your butt on a wobbly shelf, right? Which, you know, is fun to do too. But uh, so it's, again, just designed to show sexual attributes to men. And it's cheating. I mean, it's not cheating in dating. I mean, you know, all's fair in love and war. But, I mean, it's wildly inappropriate in the business context. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's important that <clears throat> if women want equality, which, <clears throat> according to some of the paperwork I've seen from some time ago, they have some interest in, <laughs> then you can't, you can't do the cheating at the same time as the equality, right? And that's something that women need to hear. <clears throat> that's something, because, <clears throat> excuse me, if a woman relies on her sexual attractiveness, you know, we're, we're mammals. You know, when, when, when you get home, like if you're driving, you got a long drive home, right? You get home, what do you do? You get out of your car and you go sit in your house because you, you, you're there. Why would you keep driving? And so <clears throat> what we do is we do enough to get what we want. And we don't generally do more, right? If, if you order a Big Mac, they don't give you five, right? Because you ordered a Big Mac, they give you a Big Mac, right? So we, we do just enough to get what we want. And if women have this sexual power and, and makeup and all of this kind of stuff, and heels, and then they'll get what they want and they won't do most, won't do more. Which means that they're missing out on all of the qualities of character that they could develop that are actually long lasting and good for raising children and good for being a great partner or a great businesswoman if that's what she wants to be. So by giving women all of this power, we're taking away the qualities of character that they could develop in the absence of that power. <clears throat> it's like a kid, well, it's almost literally like a kid. What is it? Some kid just became a billionaire at the age of 14 or 15 because his parents just gave him over a billion dollars. You think he's going to be working fast food anytime soon? No. Because now he's got the resources, so why would he work that? That's why it's, you know, rags to riches to rags. And three, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, three generations, right? First generation works like crazy. Second generation works less. Third generation blows it all. It's the churn. It's a cycle. Once we have stuff, we stop striving for stuff. Once we get home, we stop driving. And if women have all of this value because of hormones and makeup and sexual manipulation and so on, <clears throat> we're robbing them of quality of character, which we need. Because as you know, trust between the genders, trust between the sexes, is kind of catastrophically low at the moment. And that's because women, they have this crazy Tinder swipe, they have all of these online apps, so they can get all the male attention that they want in relative security. And the media 
doesn't tell them about the war. When was the last time you saw a story on TV, in the movie theater, anywhere, even online, a story which goes something like this? I wasted my youth. I took the full bloom of my beauty and I squandered it on meaningless, shallow, self-destructive sexual encounters. Like overused Velcro, I lost my capacity to bond. I got an STD or five. You know, what is it? The cougars, a woman's sexual prime is in her 40s. Well, it's not true, of course, or it's not true. It's just a way to, it's cougar propaganda, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just not, it's not true. It's not true. And of course, if you say, well, a woman's sexual prime is in her 40s because she's had so much experience, like that Alanis Morissette song about all of her former lovers, it's like, yeah, I know, I know why it was called Jagged Little Pill, because that's a whole lot of antibiotics to be taking. <clears throat> but you don't hear the story of the woman who's like, oh, my God. It's, the, it's my late 30s. I gotta go find a man. I'm almost, the, the shop is closing for babies. I've got baby rabies. I've got the fever. I want a baby. And now I've gotta start trying to attract a man when I've been working a desk job making useless spreadsheets as an affirmative, affirmative action hire for the last 20 years. My butt's wider than a Studebaker and I'm starting to get a mustache. <laughs> you want some? Right, I mean, and, and who's left? Right? Who's left in your 30s? Uh, some quality. I mean, I met my wife in my 30s, so again, these are generalities, right? But who's left in your 30s? It's like, it's like me going to California now with a Tilly hat and saying, hey, I hear there's a gold rush. Right? Sorry, man. That was picked clean a long time ago. All the quality people snapped up and off the market. It's like a really great used car. You never see it on the market. And nobody's going to sell it. So you don't see those stories. The media hides the wall from women. And you get these ridiculous stories, like there's a Bridget Jones diary story I watched just for like pure anthropological research, where this kind of chunky, neurotic, alcoholic woman in her 40s has two billionaires desperate to be the father of her unknown child. And it's like, oh my god. I mean, there's fiction, and then there's just outright fantasy. And like, I'll believe in orcs before I'll believe in that. <laughs> Here's another thing that women need to hear. Oh. A baby is not your body. Don't you always hear that? You got life growing in your belly. I can't imagine. I can't imagine, it's like, it's like to me, like a big Indian meal comes to life. <laughs> I get bloated, that's what I'm saying. Anyway, so uh, growing a life, it's not your body. Do you know that the baby can have a different blood type than the mom? You know what is your body? A kidney. A kidney is not a kid. The kidney, after nine months, doesn't say, fuck it, I'm out of here. I'm done with this darkness, man. I hear there's some light out there. I hear some cool sounds. Music, I think, is out there. It's kind of muffled. But I'm, I'm busting out, man. It doesn't sit there and, like, alien style come out your side. I don't see a lot of parents rolling around a kidney in a bag in a carriage. Look, I have a kidney. No, it's, it's ridiculous because this is what the perception is. I get, yeah, the kidney is your body, man. I get that, 100%. But a kid is not your body. A kid is not your body. So my body, my choice. Does the kid get a choice? Does the kid get a say? <laughs> and of course, every now and then as a man, I respond, is it at all possible that it could be my wallet, my choice? <laughs> irradiated bald patch on the ground where a human being used to be, right? Baby is not your body. Another thing that women seem to have really swallowed is the world is overpopulated. 
You ever hear that? You know, you should think about maybe having some kids. It's a really wonderful thing, and it's life, and it's why you're here and all that. No, the world is overpopulated. It's not wildly overpopulated by smart people. <laughs> Lots of not smart people, you know, the opening scene to Idiocracy, that previously known as fiction, now known as documentary footage, <laughs> who are like the low IQ people are just like, baby, 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 because they're not sitting there going, well, but the long-term effects of the baby on the CO2 of the atmosphere, blah, 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 right? They're like, I was horny. <laughs> Protection? Pfft. What am I, a pussy? <laughs> so you get like low IQ replicants coming at your ass, sometimes it seems like, but the smart people are like, hmm, I don't know, I'm gonna have to see what happens with my IRA. So yeah, the world's not wildly overpopulated by smart people, and if we're gonna have lots of not so smart people having babies, we're gonna need a couple of smart people to figure out how to feed and clothe them and give them health care and all that, so yeah, overpopulation. Here's another thing that ladies need to hear. For the vast majority of you, that's not a real degree. It's really not. It's not a real degree. Do you know that the vast majority, well, a significant majority of the debt, student debt is held by women, right? And the, what, what do they study? Gender studies, right? Because, you know, we want to break all the stereotypes, right? Because women choose to get involved in fields where they deal with people, and men are more comfortable with abstractions and computers and physics and math and all that kind of stuff, right? Which is fine. Nothing wrong with it. And we know that this is not the result of patriarchy, because the state is basically matriarchy. That was going to be my original speech, but I thought this would be more fun. But we know that because in places like India, when women don't have a lot of freedom, they go into like computers and they go into being doctors, uh, uh, researchers, and so on, right? But then when they get more freedom and wealth increases and there are more choices, where do they go? Oh, social worker, psychologist, teacher, 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 teacher. So when they get more choices, they go into more sex-segregated fields. Now, some of them are real, you know, we need teachers and so on, although it'd be nice if they weren't just Marxist indoctrinators, but that's a topic for another time. But it's not, you know, for the most women, it's not, not a real degree. Now, again, I say this, but see, here's the weird thing, is that I got a degree, I got a master's degree in history, the history of philosophy specifically, but I was able to weirdly monetize it on the web, right? I mean, that's like, that makes no sense at all. I couldn't have predicted that in the early 90s. When I graduated, here's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get a useless degree, I'm gonna spend 15 years as a waiter, but then what's gonna happen is an intergalactic web of human communication is gonna be developed the likes of which humanity has never seen before. It's gonna be completely free and I'm gonna be able to monetize it magically over the web. <laughs> and that's what they call a business plan. <laughs> Literally, it's like, it's like, fuck savings, I'm just gonna play the lottery. <laughs> I won? That's what you should do. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's crazy. So it's, they're not real degrees. And here's the thing. So I remember once going on a, a, a date. I, I met a woman at the gym, and I, I went on, on a date with her. Nice, nice, nice young, young woman, but she was telling me how in debt she was from her student loans, right? And it was gender studies and all that, right? So I'm a man, which means I'm a resource manager, right? What do men do? We protect and we provide. We protect and we provide. And these are the two things that the government has taken away from us, which is why there's male suicide, depression, anxiety, and an opioid crisis. We can't provide for our women because the government does it for us, which means they can treat us like shit. We get our money anyway. And when you take people's money by force, you end up having contempt for them because otherwise you feel guilt for being parasitic. It's a basic fact, right? You'll notice that the welfare state came before the general condemnation of men in popular culture. The men are idiots. Men are, because you ha you, you, if you can trick women into taking stuff from men by force through the power of the state, then automatically women will start to denigrate men. Because when you're exploiting someone, 
You can't think of them as great or good or noble or heroic, or you can't think of them positively at all. You have to denigrate them so you can exploit them. That's why the devil bribes and then the distrust mounts, the hostility and the hatred mounts. So I was looking at this woman, she says $17,000 in debt. Now, this is that's a lot of money now, but back then it was even more. It's like, I don't know, double or something like that. And, you know, the thoughts went through my brain pretty clearly. Okay, so it's 17,000 bucks. That's after tax money. So I got to earn, like, I don't know, like 30,000 bucks to just pay off this woman's debt. If we get married, that's going to be my debt. I want to have kids. It's going to delay kids by what? How long does it take to pay off, to make it pay off 30,000 bucks for quite a while? So it's just like, you know, hey, I'll buy your coffee, but that's it, right? Because we're re so when, when you laden down women with these crazy debts for degrees with almost no economic utility or negative economic utility if you count the debt, this is a form of population control, you understand, that's taking the smartest women, putting them in school, training them to hate men, be useless, come out with debt, and then men don't want to marry them. And but people don't talk about this because there's this endless propaganda. Go to school, go to university, go to university. You've got to go to university. Why? Well, because Marxists love nothing more when they claim that they don't want to exploit the workers than propagandizing workers into paying for their own indoctrination into Marxism. It's a horrible, horrible scenario. <laughs> My daughter, and people say, well, where do you want to go to university? And I haven't talked to her about this much, right? She's just like, university? I read. There's the internet. Like, well, I mean, university now, I could understand, you know, back when only 10% of the population went to university, now it's like 40, 50%. So it's not a real degree. Because, and here's the thing too, if it was a real degree, you could handle being disagreed with. You could handle being disagreed with. <laughs> a story I read when I was in my early teens was about a guy who, was, who, was, who wanted to be a swimmer, he was a teenager, he wanted to be a swimmer, but he was bullied off the beach by the mean kids. So he had to go to some other beach where there was this terrible undertow, it was really cold, there were rocks, and that's where he had to train because he was being bullied off the nice beach. And then, of course, the story is that he, he went and won every competition. Why? Because he trained under adversity. Right? Where do muscles come from? Resistance. How do you sharpen a sword? Sparks, a sand wheel, heat, pressure. If it was a real degree, women would not get upset with being disagreed with. It's not a real degree. For the most part, again, there are exceptions. It's not a real degree for the most part. Because you're not being challenged. How do you corrupt a man? How do you corrupt a woman? Because the powers that be, they want us all corrupted and dependent and uncertain, right? Well, it's funny because I think that you corrupt a man with excessive insults. And I don't mean the kind of like uh, jovial locker room guy insults, but like when you really go for his, and this is what women are trying to break men down with penis size and incel and you can't get laid and all that kind of stuff, right? Which is really insulting to women, right? Like all I can come up with is saying no. But how do you corrupt a woman? Well, you corrupt a woman with excessive praise. You corrupt a woman with excessive praise because it, it makes her hypersensitive. It makes her very difficult to disagree with. And when women look disagreeable, men don't want to marry them at all. And that's how you corrupt women. And sometimes it gets frustrating as a philosopher to look at men at this addiction to status, like men's status and, and domination and so on. And that's, you know, but there's really upsides to that. Like, that's why we have this room. It's like, yeah, some, some guy wanted to get laid, so he built a room to impress a woman. That's right? great. You know, we, we, can, <laughs> we can use the, the products of his sexual display to, to have a conference and talk about ideas and so on. So this, for men, the great weakness is status, but for women, the great weakness is vanity because it comes with that massive surge of tsunami male attention when they're young and attractive. And if you continue to praise and praise and praise women, they become hothouse flowers. They become very over-delicate, right? There's an amazing thing which you should really, really look up. I'm sure you know this guy. Uh, de Tocqueville was a French aristocrat who came to America and wrote an amazing book called Democracy in America. He was originally coming to just study the prison system. He ended up examining everything. And do you know? 
the most amazing thing that he said was this. He said, the great power, the greatest power of America is its women. It's women. Can you imagine saying that now? But why? Why was femininity, female nature, in the nascent America, in the frontier, in the West, why was it so noble, so powerful, so strong? It was, well, no, welfare state, uh, healthy voluntary relations between males and females, challenge. You know, we are, uh, you know, like hamsters in a wheel. And, you know, you know that they're not getting anywhere, but they just like it. So when we remove challenges from our life, we don't end up being at peace. We just end up inventing challenges. So women's great challenge, of course, is to choose the right guy so she doesn't get pregnant out of wedlock and destroy her life in the absence of a welfare state, right? So when women get the vote, they vote for the welfare state. They vote for old age pensions just in case they've been a shitty mom and their kids don't care for them. So they take away, oh, look, we've, we've taken away risk for women. If you get pregnant out of wedlock, we've to magically turned babies from liabilities into assets, thus reversing the entire evolutionary course of human life. So we've taken away risk from women. Marry the wrong guy, hey, no problem. You can divorce him and take half his stuff or more. In California, what is the law? Like, if you've married a woman for 10 years, you've got to support her for the rest of her life? Not overly strong and independent. <laughs> Close, but not, not over. So we take away risks from women, and we add risks to men, right? Because men now have to fight massive taxation that is, like the welfare state is basically the single mother state, right? So we take away these challenges for women. And do they say, wow, this is great. I can finally be at peace. No. Now. When you take away challenge, when you take away natural challenges from people, they just invent artificial ones. Because we are a, we didn't get to be the apex predators by sitting on our ass in a hammock, for God's sakes. We are a striving, conflict-based, challenging species. You take away our challenges. We don't get peace. We get artificial war. Now it's not childbirth and maybe I married the wrong guy and now my kid has polio. Now it's manspreading and mansplaining, and like it's it's completely ridiculous. I don't know if if I don't know if we can actually survive plenty as as a species. I don't know if we can survive success as a species. Okay, one or two more. Oh, and and there'll be. A, I'm sorry, I was going to do a bit more of a Q and A, but uh, we'll do the whole thing this afternoon at at one thirty. I've got like two hours. We'll just do a, a back and forth. But here's the other thing that women need to hear. There is no government law that can make you as economically productive as a man. Sorry. Like, I mean, you can shoot the messenger all you want. It's a fact. And I, look, I've been a manager. I've interviewed probably 1,000 people. I've hired probably 100, 150 men. Like, I've, I've done the whole gamut. I know whereof I speak. Can't do it. Why? What's the challenge? Sorry? Well, so yeah, some lack of testosterone, right? Can you, can you make the statement again, please? There's no government law. When did you stop listening? Uh, okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, so why, why are women economically less productive than men? They choose different fields. Well, I mean, some of those skills you can learn, right? So there's some stuff. But yeah, there's a certain amount of aggression. And we've been kind of trained to fight. And now co-opetition, it's called. Like you cooperate and you fight right together. It's the capitalist model, right? So men are sort of trained to be aggressive in a fight. Because in the past, like, if, if, you, if you killed, you know, one, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a hunter. At least I haven't. You kill one deer, right? You take it home to your family. The other guy doesn't get the deer. It's, like, it's not like a capitalist thing where you get mounting productivity on both sides. You go kill that deer, you bring it home, the other guy's family is hungry. So we're like, we fight. We fight, women haven't evolved that way. Women have evolved to basically be protective in numbers around the death magnets called toddlers. Have you ever had a baby? Like, <laughs> stairs. 
That's why I had to sign. They knew I was a guy up here. That's why I had to sign something. I had to plunge off the stage like Steve Tyler signed. But, but um, so women have evolved to be more nurturing. And women are, statistically, they score much higher in neuroticism, which sounds bad, but it's not because you have to worry about toddlers. You've got a whole bunch of toddlers. They're all going in different directions. Uh, it's dangerous, even in, you know, there's no predators and so on, right? So, yeah, there's that. They, they choose fields that are less, uh, and, and come on, they have babies. They have babies. You know, 40% of the women who took MBAs don't even work in business. I mean, I do this call-in show. I've done it for a long time, and women call in. Yeah, I studied to be a doctor, and then, you know, after I had my baby, I just wanted to stay home. And I'm torn, because I'm glad she's staying home, breastfeeding, you know, eye contact, skin contact, great for babies. But at the same time, no concept. I've had lots of women call in with this topic, and not one woman has said this. But I'll tell you this, I feel really, really bad that society spent a million and a half dollars to train me as a doctor, and I'm not even practicing. <laughs> not one. Well, I feel better at home, you see. And that's the end of the story. And it's like, I just see a, a guy coughing up his lungs on a sidewalk because he can't get to a doctor because we're missing a doctor. Do you know how many female engineers? I wanted to study engineering, but now I'm in sales. Now I do pharmaceutical. Right? It's real estate, you know, because engineering doesn't care about your lipstick, but if you look good on a park bench, you can sell a house, right? So society as a whole is pouring a lot of money into training women who generally often don't do what, they're, what society is trying to do. Now, if the woman was paying her own freight, it's like, OK, well, it's your money or whatever, right? But as a taxpayer, you know, we men, you know, men are way net contributors to the tax system, and women are way withdrawers from the tax system. I mean, the modern democracy is just a gyno gynocentric vote-buying mechanism for women. The other thing that I wanted to say that women need to hear is empirically, you're all not that attached to your kids. Empirically, you're not that attached to your kids. Evolutionarily speaking, we can understand that. So a woman who was not at all attached to her kids wouldn't take care of them. The kids would die genetic dead end, right? A woman who's overly attached to her kids, who will fight to the death to protect them should some other tribe come over the hill, and kill off the men, what happens to her? Yeah, she's killed, right? If she can't be taken as a war prize, and listen, I'm not, I don't, it's terrible, but women choose to do that rather than the men's fate, which is just to be killed. So you all know, like, the pride of lions, a woman has, a female lion has cubs. I don't know why I'm doing this, like, <laughs> this is how it works. But a female a lion, she has cubs, right? And if, if her, male lion, like male the husband lion or whatever, gets killed or, or is killed by another lion, uh, what does the new lion do? What's the first thing he does? He kills the cubs, right? Absolutely. And so women who are like, you can't touch those cubs, I will fight to the death to protect them, those genes didn't last. So women have to be both attached to their kids and willing to cut that attachment on a dime if it serves her genetic survival. And again, these are just harsh conditions of evolution, right? And that's why women tear up over hallmark piano images of babies and mothers and cuddling and so on. But then after Roe v. Wade, it's just like a firing squad for fetuses. Right? Is it 50 million? 50 million? Oh, well, you see, now the West is underpopulated, so we need to bring every one in from the Middle East and Africa. Too bad. If only we had 50 million people here. But you see, women. Look at the baby, of course, the fetus, as an inconvenience in their dating situation, right? And I'm not saying it's not emotionally difficult and all of that, but I'm talking about sort of the end choice and what we empirically know. If women cared more about their children, then some politician would come up and say, sorry, ladies, we're in debt. We cannot afford all these social programs. We have to cut back. Otherwise, your children are going to be literal economic slaves, mostly the Chinese banksters. You'd think that women would say, oh, man, you know, I took care of that kid. You know, I got him his shots. God help us. And wiped his butt and made him you know, baby-proof the house. So I want that kid to have economic opportunities when he grows up. So yes, we've got to do the responsible thing, because I love my children. 
So this debt is catastrophic. The unfunded liabilities in America, $180 trillion. So if women really care, and men have a deficiency in this too, but we, you know, they don't have as much sentimentality about the mother, like the father-child bond as the mother-child bond. But if women really cared about their kids, they'd be marching in the streets saying, hey man, these schools are terrible. This debt is absolutely unacceptable. We cannot vote to enslave our children for the sake of avoiding the occasional tough decision in the here and now. That's wrong. Now, see, women can't do that because now there's so many single mothers that if you cut back the welfare state, they don't come with free money for their boyfriends. So to help with the kids, it's mommy's needs that matter. And there's evolutionary reasons for that, but we gotta strip away the sentimentality and say, listen, men want taxes to go down, women want taxes to go up because women take taxes and men pay taxes on average. And the reason why we can't have a reasonable government, the reason we can't have freedom, is because mama needs the money and doesn't care how it affects the kids. And the last thing I'll say, since I enjoy speaking my mind and I hope that you enjoy it as well, free speech, man, free speech is the whole reason why we have a civilization. The whole reason, every progress that we've had, you know, property rights, the end of slavery, universal suffrage, whether it's progress or not remains to be seen, but all of these are intensely horrible at the time. Everybody thinks it's the craziest and worst idea. Every, every moral progress is hate speech to begin with. Why, why do we have hate speech threatening? Well, I mean, it's in Europe, it's in Canada, it's, it's threatening in the US. Why do we have hate speech and why did we have free speech until female suffrage? It's an interesting question. I have a theory. <laughs> it may not shock you to know. <laughs> and the theory goes a little something like this. Women, not super great at debating. Women, not super great at admitting they're wrong. Now, if you want to get engaged in societal debates, and you're not very good at debating, but you can't admit that you're wrong, what do you want? To silence the opposition. To not have certain questions raised. If you can't answer the argument and you can't stand the argument, censorship is what you want. And when I was growing up and I, I debated and fought ferociously on all these moral topics with my friends, even from sort of mid-teens onwards, some of them went on to become professors and lawyers and so on, right? We never thought of bursting into tears. We never thought of being offended. Like, that would be embarrassing. You know, I can't answer your argument on corporal punishment. I'm just upset. We'd never thought, wow, that's a really good argument about the benefits of colonialism, but I bet you have a tiny dick. <laughs> Can you imagine? I didn't even cry at 13 when my Dungeons and Dragons character got killed. So I think that, you know, occasionally I get called a misogynist, which is not an argument, of course, right? It's a really, really great argument about the welfare state, but clearly you hate women. No, see, the thing is, I actually love and respect women. The real misogynists are the ones who withhold the truth from women. The ones who pander to women out of fear. The ones who doom women to a life of lovelessness and loneliness. You know, 25% of women in the West are on antidepressants after 40, about the same proportion of childless. Female alcoholism is on the rise. Do you know, it's an amazing statistic, and I think it's even bigger than what is claimed, a third of women would prefer being diagnosed with cancer to being lonely. A third of women would rather, and I had a cancer diagnosis, I would have chosen loneliness myself, but that's just <laughs> me, right? 
Because, you know, you can be lonely, but there's nothing lonelier than being in a hole in the ground, right? Hey, worms, yay. But, we, but by withholding the truth from women, we're not treating them with respect. We're not treating them as equals. We are dooming them through our silence and through sometimes our cowardice. And I say this for myself as well. There are some topics I find tough to bring up. We are dooming them to a life of loneliness. We are dooming them to a life of depression, of anxiety. Since feminism, female unhappiness has gone up and up and up and up and up. So, you know, when I say, oh, you know, but women don't care enough about their children to blah, 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 right? Do we care enough about our women to say, damn the torpedoes? Let them call them tiny torpedoes. I'm going in. And I'm going to tell the truth. Because the alternative Pretty much the end of everything. We've got no kids, got no happiness, got no families. Women go to work and therefore foreign strangers raise, raise the children. There's no transmission of Western culture. That's it. It's done. Do women love their children enough to vote for smaller government? I think it's possible. Do we love women enough to save everything by telling them the truth? I'll leave that in your hands. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks.